So, hello everyone who, who is here. My name is Lyuba Malyuba and I work at the Balkan Heritage Foundation. And tonight I will be moderating the seminar. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our guest lecturer, Dr. Andrew Coe, who was my professor during, while I studied at Brandeis University in the US. So he has a very short but very impressive resume that I will go over now. So Dr. Andrew Coe founded the Arkham Project in 2003 to integrate the study of ancient organic residues into fieldwork and facilitate its transdisciplinary accessibility, a goal best exemplified by the collaborative open Arkham database. He holds a bachelor's in biophysics and classics from the University of Illinois, a master's in biblical studies, and a PhD in archaeology and archaeological science from the University of Pennsylvania. He completed his dissertation in residence at the Stanford Archaeology Center as an exchange scholar and received postdoctoral training at the University of Michigan. Before joining Yale University as an associate research scholar in Near Eastern languages and civilization and primary investigator of the Yale Peabody Museum Asian Pharmacology and Medicine Lab, Dr. Coe was the Florence Levy K. Fellow in Chemistry and Classical Studies at Brandeis University founding its Digital Humanities Lab and was subsequently appointed a Senior Research Fellow in the MIT Center for Materials Research in Archaeology and Ethnology uh, and the Research Associate of the Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near East. That is a mouthful. <laughs> he is an active field archaeologist who co-directs the Southern Focus Regional Project and has served on committees for the Archaeological Institute of America, American Society of Overseas Research, National Endowment for the Humanities, American Chemical Society, Getty Research Institute, Town of Concord Historical Commission, and Boston Museum of Science. So without further ado, Dr. Coe will talk about his latest project and the site of the Svina. Dr. Coe. Wonderful. Thank you for the generous introduction, Luba. It's been such a pleasure uh, to uh, uh, to have known you now for, I guess it's over five years, close to getting closer yeah. to 10 years. It's amazing. Uh, it's just wonderful to see you in such a wonderful environment at the Balkan uh, Heritage Foundation and doing such wonderful work. Uh, I want to thank you and the rest of the, uh, the, the fine uh, people of uh, the foundation for inviting me today and to be able to share um, some of the exciting things um, that have been fortunate enough to be a part of, as Luba just introduced, it's been quite a journey. I just met with some of the administrators at my university. I'm new there starting in, in July. And they're um, understandably, I think kind of uh, both uh, fascinated, not necessarily because I'm doing something so, uh, so, uh, necessarily so groundbreaking, but at least in part because for better or worse, I think what I do is kind of uh, unique. Um, and, and they are very fascinated about um, my role in archaeology in general. And, you know, archaeology fascinates, as you know, um, uh, those outside of archaeology, but especially what I do since it intersects with the humanities, the sciences, so on and so forth. Um, it's been wonderful to be um, at an institution where um, it's it's also about supporting archaeology, but just as with your foundation, uh, thinking about best practices and all that. So I hope to share uh, some of those things uh, with our time together today. And I look forward to any questions. Please um, do in any sense, um, whether in our time together today, ask questions or I'm happy to continue discussion um, through email, which is listed here at, at the bottom of, of the title slide, because as Uba knows, I'm always happy to uh, be part of a much bigger community where we could think about how best to support each other and, and, and proceed into the future, because ultimately we all want archaeology to do well and, and to be something that um, contributes to, to all the different um, societies and worlds that we're a part of. So today I want to talk about an area not too far from where many of you are located. Let's see, if did, that, did that work, Luba? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I want to make sure. That's working. Um, so we're talking about this area. Uh, so of course, Bulgaria is just to the north of here. Uh, so we're talking about um, central Greece right here. Uh, uh, let's see if this works. Great. So I'm gonna proceed a little bit gingerly at first, uh, Luba, to make sure everything's working. <laughs> so 
Yeah, so literally uh, just about dead center of uh, of the modern day country of Greece, especially if you consider like Crete down here. So it very much is uh, it's the geographic center uh, of the country. Um, and you can see it zoomed in here in the, in the lower right. So uh, it's a very um, fascinating area. Um, as many of you who are familiar with archaeology know, uh, not all spaces are uh, the same in the sense of just by pure distance, but the terrain and, and those kind of things, friction points, as they would call it in GIS, really matters. And that's what fascinated me first about this area of what's called Central Greece. But at the same time, you can see it occupies a space that's very, um, uh, very much uh, at a crossroads. So if this pointer works, you can see that, yes, it's the most southern area of Central Greece and Northern Greece or whatever you want to call it. But at the same time, it's it's it because of the Corinthian Gulf here, it occupies a space that connects. It's the most southern end of this landmass of, of northern Greece, uh, but then it has immediate access uh, by water to the, the the really the southern part of Greece, the Peloponnese, uh, east towards Athens, and of course, then uh, depending on which direction you go, it connects you to Italy, it connects you to the south, and then to um, Athens, and then the east. So. Um, as an area that very much occupies um, a crossroads, that is what first piqued my interest. Of course, uh, there are other things that make this area famous. Um, for instance, so this is a, a, a zoom in of, of, the, of the region of Southern Focus, and in particular, uh, the center of even this region is what we're focusing on. Um, as you might know from this map, there are very famous, the, the famous site of Delphi, which is the Panhellenic Sanctuary from, from uh, you know, quote unquote, classical Greece. That is, um, uh, I'm, I'm focusing on time periods, uh, the so-called pre-classical time periods before the rise of Delphi. So it's a little bit different, but at the same time, uh, because of all the research that's been done in Delphi by both the Greeks and the French, it, it does influence the work that we do. But nevertheless, it is a separate thing because there's a major valley that separates Delphi from the rest of Southern Focus. And um, as the terrain shows you from Google Maps, I'll show you a better picture right now. Uh, it's quite mountainous, which, uh, of course, um, anybody who's familiar with Southeast Europe will be familiar with. So again, uh, this is our site right here, the, the, the core, the nucleus of our study region. It's uh, primarily a late Bronze Age site, a so-called Mycenaean citadel. And you can see the famous uh, later classical site of Delphi. Uh, in terms of pure distance, it's actually quite close. But again, this major valley separates it. And as a result, uh, you can see here, I, I, I showed you this Google uh, maps uh, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, travel um, directions to show you that despite it being as a crow flies very, you know, 10 kilometers or less, in fact, it takes you around, you know, 30 to 40 minutes to drive because of the, the landscape. Um, this is really one major landmass that extends all the way towards Bulgaria. This is the southern end of it, of the same geologic feature. Um, uh, the local names is Mount Kirfis, and then the valley separates it from Mount Parnassus. But geologically, it's really the same thing, but just due to tectonic activity, it's been separated by this valley. Um, the the importance for our study is that it creates this kind of very unique uh, local ecosystem. It's it's um, a triangular in shape. It's separated from the rest of Greece by this mountain and valley. There are access points here, and as you can see, kind of around here. But it creates a discrete unit that makes for a very fascinating uh, study area that's um, manageable, uh, but still diverse and big enough that we can ask some some bigger questions in our archaeological research. So you can see here um, uh, the view from the village, the modern village of Desfina, which was founded around a thousand years ago, um, and then you can see Mount Kirifis here. Uh, Mount Parnassus, which is a famous uh, mountain in, in history and classical mythology. And then the, the valley that I mentioned is right in between. You can't really see it. Delphi is actually in this above on the other side of that mountain. Um, because of this unique location, you can see that in a moment's notice, the climate um, and the weather can change dramatically. So this is not in the winter, uh, which is common terrain, as you know, but this is right in the middle of our one of our 2018 summer season. And um, so basically the same view um, that I just showed you previously. So it could literally look like this in the, um, 
oops, this is working. Here we go. It can look like this in the morning, and then by the afternoon, it can look like this. But you can see um, one thing to note is that um, it's very arid as you go towards the south. Um, so uh, because of the mountains and the so-called rain shadow, uh, Mount Kirfis is the last um, mountain. Um, so as as the as the fronts come in from the north, it's where the last rainfall happens, and then the clouds then lose the ability to hold enough moisture to rain. So um, as a result this plane survives, the Desvina plane survives because of the fact um, it's it's the last, it's the most southern extent of this kind of this rain opportunity. You can see exactly here what I'm talking about because this is Mount Kerfis and then it rains on the southern slopes and then it stops raining. Uh, this is a common occurrence and you can see here another view. This happened and, uh, in 2018 and then later that day it was sunny again to kind of show you how uh, it's, it's really at the confluence of all these um, geologic and, and weather patterns. Um, so with that in mind, um, why does uh, it matter to study Southern Focus? Like I mentioned, it's like this discrete peninsula of triangular shape. Um, it's very much at the crossroads of all the different regions uh, as far as Italy, Crete, and the, the, the ancient Near East. But at the same time, it, it, it's a discrete unit. So it's as much, if not more, connected to these other areas because sea accessibility is so easy um, and it's so difficult to connect to the rest of the mainland. So even though you're close, um, as you'll see here, to many major and famous uh, um, urban centers, Nevertheless, it's not easy to get to them unless perhaps you travel by the sea. So many of you will, will recognize some of these names, uh, Archimedes, uh, Glaw, Thebes, of course, Athens, Corinth is down here, Mycenae, Terence. Uh, so despite the proximity to many of these sites, it's really um, uh, travel by sea that connected this area um, as much um, uh, as, as travel by land, as I'll point out in a second. So yes, you have this connection uh, most easily this direction and through this direction, um, but it's it's uh, by sea almost certainly where in, at least in the pre-classical period that much of the contacts were made. Uh, just a quick overview of the recent history of research over the last couple of generations. So um, my, my dissertation supervisor, actually, when he was a graduate student at, at University of California, Berkeley, and later when he was a professor at Penn, he started the historical survey of focus um, in the late 80s. And though this might seem uh, somewhat uh, um, something that's not that obvious, the reason why this was so important is because uh, as you know, to this day, much of the research that happens, in particular in Greece and other areas of the world, it often focuses on these very famous urban centers, um, Athens, Mycenae, etc. So um, what Jeremy McInerney did was, what, is it, what does it look like when we tra uh, travel in areas that don't have a wealth of research in the past, and seemingly, you know, they were, must have been important in uh, in, in the more distant past, but very little attention is brought to them because they don't have a famous name or famous mythology attached to them. So he started that work in the in the in the late '80s, and then more recently, you know, it, it, research in these kind of areas that aren't very famous are kind of sporadic, as you know. Um, by necessity, there was a rescue excavation done at the main urban center there, the late Mycenaean center, in 2005, because. Um, some an unfortunate incident happened where looters dynamited these tombs um, up on the site, and as a result, they the the local authorities, the FRE, had to go in and try to clean up as best as possible. Um, but again, this is uh, an unfortunate circumstance, and the resources aren't there, so uh, there's only so much the, the authorities can do. So they are aware of it, they secured it, um, but if, again, uh, they don't have tons of resources and time to immediately do a rescue excavation. So it wasn't until over 10 years later in 2016 that um, my uh, main collaborator, Yanis Liritsis, who at the time was a professor at the University of Aegean, he uh, reached out to his uh, good friend and colleague at University of San Diego, uh, University of California, San Diego, uh, Tom Levy, and they inaugurated a, a collaborative um, 
study in 2016. It was much. It was part of a much bigger study that uh, Tom Levy was spearheading. He's currently working in Caesarea in the, in, in, uh, the Levantine coast because he's connecting uh, the the the, uh, the connections between the uh, land and sea. And of course, this area of southern focus was of keen interest. Um, but again, the goal wasn't just to focus on Southern Focus. It, it very much was a component of it, and it, and it kicked off the, uh, a new round of studies and, and resources and attention so that the site could be studied that was very familiar now because of the rescue excavations that were started. And what this um, initial uh, research program in 2016 allowed was a better understanding and promise of this area. So the goals of this initial study, um, a much bigger overarching study, was to just kind of get the lay of the land. Um, and I listed some of the ideas here, marine archaeology, uh, people seeing this later could pause it and, and read it more at depth. But in, in, in essence, it was just a way to initiate the studies. And, and this is why I, I even, um, as you know, uh, if, even if you don't plan to work at a site for 30 years, um, we very much live, uh, we very much practice in a profession that is very reliant on um, our predecessors and, of course, what might come later. And as links of a chain, uh, depending how, how one link happens, it can affect really how uh, much further work is done. And thanks to the excellent work of uh, both uh, Yanis and Tom in 2016 and, and the, the, the year or two after, it, it really set us up well where it made it possible that um, we could continue studies uh, more recently. So that's exactly what happened um, in 2000, around 2018. We looked at the two major studies done up to that point. So first from Jeremy with his dissertation, uh, he had pointed out that long before the famous classical period, this Fokian Federation, there was something loosely referred to as a tribe. So this is the it's referring to the pre-classical area of focus and his idea of let's let's study uh, the 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 periods before things became so famous and we can look at origins and how do these major uh, urban centers and societies start. So that was a great um, initial foray into the topic of southern focus. And then of course uh, Tom and Yanni's then continued on in 2016, and what they pointed out is. Uh, somewhat of anomaly, like how does the seemingly peripheral site, because that's the narrative up to this point, right? You had the major urban centers at places like Thebes or Kamenos, Mycenae, uh, and even Athens and Sparta, and every every other area was the hinterland and you know villages that supplied these urban centers. But um, we all know in reality that these categories, um, especially using a modern perspective, aren't so clear and so neat and clean. Uh, so what this opportunity allows is for us to start um, trying to figure out um, how completely do we understand um, these interesting societies of the past and, and honestly how incorrect we often are or, or, or our viewpoints have been totally um, uh, more modern in outlook. And so what have we misunderstood in the past in essence? Because as Tom points out here with along with his co-authors, um, there is this incredibly rich uh, site um, that's smaller but incredibly well built with lots of rich material culture. So how does this fit into the existing structures which don't seem to take into account the possibility for a site like this? So it's always good to study the, the, the anomalies um, in the present system. So that's exactly what the goal of the Southern Focus Research Project has been. Um, so with this kind of unique um, mission and perspective in mind, because of my own background from the start and, and Yanis's background, we uh, committed to making sure that we approach things not just as been done for the last hundred years in, in so-called Greek archaeology uh, and, and Bronze Age archaeology, but also incorporate uh, as many scientific methods as possible. Uh, so we wanted to run like a different dig, not just to run a different dig, but perhaps to then see and discover things that might have been missed in the past uh, uh, based upon a more traditional kind of approach. Um, and a corollary to that, and it fits very well with my position at the Peabody Museum, is to then elucidate um, the nuances 
of not just the local region, but how it connects to uh, farther regions, uh, both in the area of the Aegean, but even farther than that, places like you know um, Western Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean, et cetera. So with that in mind, we, we have all these technologies and approaches that are very common uh, that many people know, but uh, we, we truly endeavor to incorporate it into um, as best as possible into our research design. So that's been our approach now for uh, uh, going on uh, five years. Um, the idea of, of having comprehensive math methods and always a big picture in mind. So here we are in 2018, starting with our, our pilot season. And then uh, again, kind of elucidate the the nature of this diverse region, but then also how it connects to other ones. So for instance, um, nobody has properly studied what the relationship is between this region that's kind of separated and surrounding more famous regions. Uh, to give you a quick example of why this is kind of in some ways a missing piece of the puzzle, um, we know that the major that this being now recognized as a major site that it seems it, it certainly had to have been connected with other sites in some ways so with that premise in mind all of a sudden we can start thinking about well how does it connect to these other areas and then when you do a gis study and see how you can physically get to these other areas um all of a sudden for instance when we did when we did a least slope path it all of a sudden it connects these more famous city states um, that seem to be somewhat random, but now when you see how it connects to the sea, um, it follows exactly along the lines where these um, other cities were founded. So all of a sudden it seems less random. So the ability to, to better understand um, evidence we've, we've encountered in the past, but now making it uh, make more sense thanks to new knowledge that we've gained. Uh, these assumptions we can make like, the, the, the size and sophistication of the site necessitates that this wasn't just some hinterland, but it served the bigger role. So we can start asking a question what that bigger role might have been. So again, uh, that includes uh, things that are slightly different from most archaeological projects, at least in Greece. So we incorporate things like oral histories, talking to as best as possible, asking questions about the landscape. So this was in 2018. And to show you how important this is, as many of you know, um, we talked to the eldest people, the elders of, of, of the town of Desfina, and this was in 2018, and um, none of these three uh, seniors are, are with us today. So thankfully, we recorded it and, 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 and wrote down these histories and learned all these things that are disappearing uh, from the human record since none of it's written down So uh, until recently. So we've been trying to copy all these kind of things and record them. Um, just as the Balkan Heritage Foundation does, we are very committed to running uh, a field school that is interdisciplinary, international, and inclusive in nature. So uh, the public archaeology component is very important. Uh, many, if not most, of our um, junior staff are teachers. Um, and uh, so that reflects kind of our outlook. And we very much uh, believe um, that uh, the project should be something that um, involves the local town, not just uh, as a support entity, but as an integral part of our own research plans. Uh, we meet with the mayors, the, the local um, authorities, and uh, this is very much um, under a Greek permit and a Greek excavation. And we are, uh, I, I, if I can say it so boldly, we are, I always view ourselves as partners, but even uh, junior partners of sorts, um, because we very much want this to be something that is uh, run um, ultimately by the Greeks, because um, after long after we might be gone, then they can continue on. Um, because that's one thing I've noticed um, throughout my entire training as a graduate student, all these excavations of historical nature all over the world uh, done by um, uh, countries and institutions with much resources. Once they leave, um, oftentimes uh, everything collapses. So uh, we want to be very certain that these things can continue with the next generations of, of the local residents of, of, the, of the town. So I mentioned uh, this regional access has been fundamental to what we're understanding. So this is the first thing, as I mentioned, that we saw that this connection uh, um, to these other areas would explain why the site of Kastruli, this major citadel, exists. 
Um, it's a local plane. Um, but then that started getting us thinking that just down the, the road from, from Kastruli is another un, uh, somewhat unknown site that we know is a major um, urban center and it seems to control this harbor area. So all of a sudden it's connecting this picture and that's been one of our goals is to kind of figure out how all these regions connect. So here, here's the site of Steno, which is the harbor town, never been excavated. And you can see it makes for an ideal uh, harbor for the Bronze Age. We know that to the just to the east here, the much uh, bigger uh, Antikyra Bay, uh, over here and then even farther to the east was the classical harbors. Um, but as often as the case, the needs in the Bronze Age were different from the classical period. So um, what thing that the 2018 study by Tom Levy and his collaborators found out is that uh, th this almost certainly for various reasons was the Bronze Age Harbor, which fits well with uh, the Citadel be overlooking it and then settlement being there. And as I'll talk about later uh, today, it's a major uh, part of the um, uh, the next phase of research. So you can see how uh, we're trying to piece together how this all connects. Uh, you can see here, um, uh, this is from the desk feeding the plane. You can see it's higher in elevation. It's uh, um, anywhere from 600 meters to higher up. Um, the top of the peaks are more like a thousand meters. And you can see the sea level and the port of uh, Steno here. And you can see because of what I mentioned with the, uh, we're, here I'm on the southern slope of um, Mount Kirfis looking south. And it, it becomes increasingly arid. You can see by the time you get to the other side, it's, it's quite dry. And as you go down, it's incredibly dry. This is kind of a, the most southern area where uh, you could cultivate um, crops uh, and so on and so forth. So you have this almost certainly a symbiotic relationship between uh, Steno with the sea and then the site of Kastruli up here uh, with agricultural activities. And we know that because up in Kastruli, um, there was, uh, there's a lot of signs that they were consuming um, marine um, uh, you know, uh, food, uh, fish, mollusks, et cetera. So we know for certain that there was a relationship between the two. Presumably, as we study Steno, we'll probably discover that uh, Kastruli and the Desvina Plain was probably providing um, as a complement uh, um, cereal goods, uh, wine, or whatever else to the port that wasn't able to uh, produce it themselves. So there was some kind of relationship between the two areas that we're trying to figure out now. And in between, there's all signs of material culture. This is from a from probably the classical period, but it gives you an idea that this area has always been uh, well occupied, um, but again, um, understudied and never really um, recognized because it's not really famous um, in the the historical record. Um, just quickly stepping back again to the bigger picture, how we started with all this. Uh, most of my training, um, in my dissertation phase was done in East Crete. And one of the first things that one notices when they work there, especially if you have a broader mindset, is how it connects to all the other regions. So that's the first thing I noted. And uh, this is part of a much bigger discussion that I won't really focus on today, but many people in the past have focused on are these connections between these different areas as we can even see. Um, for instance, these are the objects I've been studying, have studied in East Crete, and the similarities they hold with objects, you know, this, these are objects found all the way uh, in the Phoenician coast, uh, in modern day uh, northern Israel and, and, and southern Lebanon, and of course, then uh, these are very Aegean in shape, and uh, we're talking about these networks, right, so at our site here at, at Kastruli, you can see again, uh, this kind of dialogue based upon uh, ceramic forms and decoration. So the question is, how does this, again, areas connect uh, to the wider world? Uh, many of you are familiar with this, uh, books like with Eric Klein talking about the, the late, late Bronze Age collapse. And our region is very much a part of that because our site uh, was destroyed right at the end of the Bronze Age. So again, how that all fits in. We have some clues um, that are often overlooked. For instance, um, at a site right near us, right across the Corinthian Gulf at Portes, and also in East Crete, another area where I've worked, um, the, it's clear that these objects are almost certainly the same thing. Um, in, in the case of um, at least one of these, it was originally published as a bronze basket. Um, and you can see in, 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 there, there was a material inside um, that they weren't familiar with what they were for, but it's clear what these are in fact are the famous head 
um, pieces, the bronze head pieces of uh, the Peleset, the so-called Philistines. And you can see them depicted at Medina and Habu in Egypt. And if you look closely, they are in fact wearing um, these bronze head pieces. Uh, the cloth that I showed you earlier was almost certainly uh, the skull cap or whatever that lets it be comfortable to be worn. And then, of course, the feathers that were put into the top uh, don't survive. Um, but again, what are these uh, so-called Philistine headpieces doing in, in East Crete and in Central Greece is, is the big question um, that can't really be answered unless you ask these big questions uh, that we're trying to do. So with this all in mind, we had three initial areas of interest in 2018 looking at this landscape. Uh, one was the citadel itself. Um, and that is where many traditional excavations would have just left off and focused on that. But again, we're, we're trying to approach things slightly differently. So we also want to look at um, other interesting parts of their society. So as I'll point out for a reason, we looked at this plain to the south. And finally, we looked at this, uh, what's obviously now Potter's Quarter, uh, up here on the southern slopes of Mount Kirfis, which is where I took that uh, earlier picture from looking south. And it's just really fascinating how rich um, the material culture of this area, just like in Bulgaria, it's 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 uh, the the famous classical palace here is, is is almost certainly located oops located there, destroyed by Alexander the Great uh, or his father by Philip during the Sacred War, so on and so forth. So it's it's an incredibly rich uh, cultural and 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 uh, natural landscape um, that we're just beginning to start to uncover. Um, initially, um, the work that was done, these were the, the looted tombs in 2005, which first brought attention to this area. Uh, so starting in 2016, um, the University of Aegean and University of California San Diego teams started uh, properly uh, rescuing the, uh, the material that was first dynamited in 2005. And as a compliment to that, they excavated this building uh, fairly close to it starting in, in 2016. So that was the initial work just to get an idea of the site. Um, and of course, uh, here's the tomb here. Um, these are uh, very uh, massive tombs uh, with so-called Cyclopean masonry, as you can see, that um, surprised to a certain degree. Um, people knew that there were large stones uh, surrounding the citadel. People weren't sure uh, what date they were and what, what they signified. But with these excavations, what they did show was for a relatively small site, this wasn't just some solitary outpost full of some soldiers or something like that. But it's clear now this was a major urban center based upon these tombs and these buildings. Uh, you can see some of the materials that came out of uh, this rescue. Uh, all the hallmarks of a major uh, um, center and an elite tomb. You, you have um, Mycenaean figurines. Uh, you had these very fine stirrup jars. Uh, there are also bits of um, of bronze and gold, uh, which almost certainly was part of what was looted, but there were enough bits of it that we, we knew that this was uh, an elite tomb of the highest order, which needs to be explained why a seemingly uh, inconsequential site, as would be defined by the present um, structures and understanding of, of, of Mycenaean archaeology, a peripheral site, how it could have a tomb uh, that's as elite as any other major urban center in, in the Mycenaean world. So uh, one of the last things they did um, in, in the first um, round of, of excavations is in addition to excavating at these two locales in this southern area, um, because it was relatively flat, they did uh, so some geophysical prospection and they saw um, ab uh, above the surface, you can, as you can barely see here, but also through the magnetometry, they saw that there were a whole bunch of, of, of walls almost certainly. So um, as a result of that, being one of the last things they did in their seasons, uh, we thought that was that'd be a very good place for us to kind of, um, as the next chapter of studies done on site, to 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 see uh, what we could discover um, and also become familiar with the site ourselves. So we focused um, in 2018, and then of course there was a pandemic disruption, and this past summer we we uh, as best as possible wrapped up in that area, and. Um, what we discovered, unsurprisingly, were, were these massive so-called Cyclopean walls um, in 2018. 
um, and all kinds of pottery. At this stage of excavations, um, again, we don't want to run a typical um, excavation. Uh, we want to measure carefully and plan uh, with the years and what we want to accomplish. Uh, the more we excavate on the citadel means more, uh, more um, commitment of resources to that area, which would then preclude us from doing uh, more regional studies or looking at the harbor sites. So we've been very careful in excavating too much. Um, and on top of that, we have to study um, uh, comprehensively the, the finds that started coming up in 2005 with the original rescue excavation. So what you have in this image are many of the objects from the elite tomb that came up, these fine stirrup jars uh, that have never been mended. Um, there was not uh, really an official conservation and study um, uh, um, area um, uh, developed and, and established over the since 2005. So that was one of our major goals this season and starting in 2018 was to assess uh, the work that's been done in the past and also um, uh, what should be done with this materials that had come up. So not the most glamorous part of the job, but we felt the responsible thing to do. So the good news for us is while we're at studying the so-called legacy objects from the previous excavations, um, it allows us to scientific study them um, with, with my specialty with organic residue analysis. Um, we're also doing fabric analysis um, here. Um, the site for the first time has um, a very um, uh, well-regarded uh, ceramicist in Dr. Cheryl Floyd, who is an expert in Aegean ceramics. Uh, very few of them actually exist, less than 50 probably in the world. Um, and she's one of them. And she, we, we were lucky to get her. So we, for the first time ever, made an official study area where someone like her could study the pottery, starting with the material uh, from 2005. And for the first time ever, ever we made a proper um, conservation area. Um, so uh, Yota Monti from the Ionian University, uh, she came with her students um, and we, we together set up this area where could do, they could do the proper conservation uh, of these objects that have been um, excavated since 2005. And now we're also in the process like many other people's um, doing things like 3D models. So then we could uh, we, we can share these ideas more, wi more uh, widely. Uh, of course, uh, as tombs, um, uh, all sorts of, uh, of osteological remains, um, faunal remains uh, were uncovered along with ceramics. So now we have a program of the study of the human osteology, uh, which is possible now because we do have these study areas. And this couldn't have happened at any time uh, too soon. So here we see in 2018, um, the results of that initial excavation. We opened up uh, a manageable three squares. And we, in fact, um, for the first time ever, we're clearly able to, uh, to come up with the phases of um, most, if not all, of the main occupation of the site, which was not possible in the past because of the fact that it was just uh, looking at the tomb. We knew from the tomb of a general time period and excavating the domestic context for the first time allowed us to really uh, stratify um, the, the domestic occupation. And what's interesting about this is of course, it goes into the iron age, uh, but the earliest uh, phases, and we were just clearing that up this past summer, seems to be around LH3B, which is after, um, the earliest part of the tomb. So almost certainly um, the center of the site will have the earliest parts, but by all measures, it doesn't look like there was any major occupation on this site uh, before the late Bronze Age. So this information that we're clarifying now. So this was in 2018, the three trenches. And of course, one of the most important things that we discovered in 2018 is uh, right behind Savannah here uh, in this area, which is here. So it's actually inside, um, there's two buildings you can see here. There's one building, which we call building two west. Uh, here's building two east with an alley in between. So just inside the building, we barely were able to excavate it right here is where we found uh, this linear B inscription, which almost certainly is referring uh, to uh, textiles. Um, 
you can you can see in fact that um, this area historically has been uh, uh, pastoral, so lots of sheep. Um, so textiles were almost certainly a major part of the the local industry, and um, as it is in the present day. So in the past, almost certainly this was a major uh, textile production area. There's we found lots of loom weights that support it, and this was probably a major reason why um, this site was important. Um, uh, somehow dealing with supplying the interior. Um, but the Bee Ocean Plains, but also probably connecting to the sea and perhaps trade um, farther afield. Another thing that we did because um, it, the the rescue uh, early st earlier stage we're not didn't have the time and resources to do it perhaps um, we uh, and thanks to modern technology and access to it we started doing a much uh, more regional. Um, survey using drones, of course, as everyone does now. So we did a kind of um, extensive drone documentation. So you can see the site right here, which is most intensively done, but then we're slowly starting to piece it together because we want the entire region uh, documented by drone. Um, in terms of, and in addition to the extensive drone survey, we've done, we did an intensive one right over our study area. Um, and, and, and because of um, the expertise at hand and our desire to, again, kind of run a slightly different um, excavation project with resources uh, allocated differently, uh, we uh, invested heavily in, in the drone documentation to the point where we did uh, two um, drone flyovers over the uh, excavation area uh, every day uh, that we could use um, live with our, with our, uh, our excavators. Um, in addition, of course, a, 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 a photogrammic documentation of the site was never done, so we did that at very high resolution. And here, here's more details about the twice a day uh, drone uh, documentation. It was done at a relatively low elevation of 15 meters, uh, very intensively, and it got very high resolution. And, um, and it allows us to see in real time uh, progress. Uh, um, we're still in the process, but ultimately our hope is to do like a time lapse um, uh, a video sort where we can see from the first day of excavations to the last days and see the progress that was made um, in relatively uh, um, frequent documentation. Uh, what we did this past season, as, um, as many of you have done, it was a transitional season because we weren't certain of the nature of, of, of what uh, the COVID disruption would do, we had to kind of plan very broadly. So uh, on one hand, we weren't able, we decided not to uh, ambitiously open up new trenches um, because again, that would have been, we didn't know how many people would come with us, um, but we saw it as an opportunity um, to better develop other areas of the site. So what we planned to do and we did was finish up in better detail the previous trenches, but then also plan for um, the, the more regional studies. So we can see here in 2022, we opened up the trenches again, we cleaned them, we documented them, finished up uh, some of the areas that we weren't able to finish up. Uh, two areas in particular we focused on was this area to the south, um, which we had found pottery, but we stopped that in 2018. And of course, this area where we had found the linear B uh, piece, uh, those two areas we focused in. So here's where the, we were able to clean that properly and, and, and fully document it, and also clean up this area where there's much surface pottery. And we found many interesting things. Um, to our utter surprise in this area where there was a linear B, so this is just inside the building, we found um, at least two neonatal remains. We believe now, in fact, uh, it might've been uh, under the original floor because uh, even though it's such a small area, we're fairly certain that we just hit the floor and just underneath that were these burials. Uh, so intramural burials, which are uh, no, well known in this time period. And then what's fascinating about the other area that we want to clean up, which had a lot of pottery in 2018 on the surface, uh, we found clear remains of feasting, even a, a late Hellatic three pictorial crater which is very, uh, which is connected, as we know, to to wine uh, feasting, and we're studying that, uh, even taking organic residue samples, and and many signs of of uh, feasting um, with um, animal remains, faunal remains, goat in particular, but also there's also remains of, um, in addition to goat, uh, there seems to be also remains of a bovine, so some major feasting taking place. Um, as I mentioned, we also wanted to expand beyond um, uh, just 
looking at the Citadel itself, which is right here. We wanted to use this opportunity to be flexible because we didn't know what resources we would have, but that allowed us then to study more in depth these other areas. I mentioned this plain to the south. And what's fascinating about it, of course, is that uh, in the modern day, it actually forms a seasonal lake, approximately of this size, and almost certainly larger in the Bronze Age. We're starting to do cores to kind of figure out the limits of this original uh, seasonal lake. Today that it hosts uh, rich vineyards. Uh, but the reason why we know that it's important is uh, in this study area, there were there are two major remains. Uh, so up here right near the citadel on its, near its southern slopes, there's a major built feature. The lower levels almost certainly seem Mycenaean because we found Mycenaean pottery around here, but then it's been repaired for many centuries, even up to the modern day. We, 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 we imagine and we feel that um, in addition to the Bronze Age uh, material, uh, it seems like in the classical periods, the Roman periods, uh, Byzantine and onwards, um, there were repairs done. Um, and for good reason, uh, because it actually, in fact, drains this lake. And it serves as a, we think, a cistern or a water source. Um, just to the south here, there's a smaller feature, which is probably an air gap. So we want to figure out the nature of this drain. You can see how much sediment is done because this was uh, where the water still drains. Uh, but in uh, uh, the future season, we plan to excavate this. So we have a nice stratified um, example, perhaps, of what how we can date this structure. And you can see, in fact, the worked masonry, um, probably from the Bronze Age. And this is a, a feature, again, the, the smaller drain that was maintained over many years. Uh, steps that go down, and then we uh, we actually drop the camera down there this season, and we could see that, in fact, it goes much further, and the earliest remains do, in fact, see Mycenaean, and once again, you can see repair work done over the many centuries. So we slowly want to uh, figure out what the, uh, the ramifications and significance of this engineering work is. Uh, so we took um, our highest uh, resolution um, drone images here that allowed us to uh, continue studying it at depth. Um, just to the east in Boeotia, we are very familiar based upon um, historical accounts um, that in fact, uh, same kind of um, issue um, in the famous Capias Basin, there was a lake here. Um, now it's it's one of the, the largest agricultural zones in the entire country uh, because um, Clearly, in the, in the late Bronze Age, uh, based upon the work that's been done there, it was drained. Uh, uh, eventually, the whole plain, we believe, was drained and cultivated. Uh, this is the original look before, really, it was properly drained. And then it flooded and became marshy again for thousands of years until in the 19th century, the, the, the French and the Greeks uh, once again drained it. So, and, and it's once again the richest agricultural land. So when, since we have these major hydrological works that we know are Mycenaean just to the east, it then started to um, raise the question of perhaps this area, in fact, is connected in some way, uh, if not in uh, political affiliation, then at least technologically somehow, uh, they seem to share the engineering expertise. So um, that naturally um, uh, led us to suspect that in fact, the area of Southern Focus is somehow connected to Boeotia. So that is that, uh, which is why we did the least slope path and we're continuing to um, investigate that relationship. And finally, um, this connection, uh, not just between the Citadel and engineering works, but also another point of reference in this area that was important is we know, uh, based upon um, initial studies, um, that this area on the southern slope of uh, Kirfis, Mount Kirfis, seems to be the potter's quarter from uh, for the entire uh, uh, time period. Um, and there's several reasons why we believe this is the case. One, you need obviously a lot of trees and uh, water to make and fire pottery and you need good clay. And this is one of the few areas that has all three. Uh, if there's a pottery um, quarter, a potter's quarter, it almost certainly has to be in this Northern area of the Desfina Plain because that's where the trees are, that's where the water is. So the next piece is of course the proper clay source. 
And that's exactly what's here. And initial studies scientifically showed that, in fact, uh, the pottery um, from both the Mycenaean period and later periods, uh, the geologic profile matches uh, the clay beds, uh, the, the soil over here. Um, and what's fascinating is you can see the citadel here. And there are terraces that are of Mycenaean origin that stretches um, here to here. So almost certainly, this is the path that they took to get to this potter's quarter in the Bronze Age. Uh, you can see the vista here. You can see the terrace uh, to the left uh, over here. And then you could see uh, the different clay beds. Um, why this is important is you can see that there's more morally clay, uh, and but also the redder clay. So depending on the, uh, the, the type of pottery you're trying to make, you have all the resources necessary to make the pottery. And, and it, it's clear that uh, they were using this uh, for many centuries. So we once again did a, a high resolution uh, 3D model of this area to kind of start connecting. You can see the terrace wall that they built uh, 3,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago. Uh, and then what's fascinating is uh, there are lots of uh, Bronze Age and later remains here. The clay beds are here. And then there's also a cistern um, uh, right here. So you, here's the clay beds. Here's the Bronze Age remains and later remains, the potter's quarters. You can see the buildings clearly never been excavated, the different clay beds and uh, the cistern right here that to this day holds uh, many, many liters of water. So here's the, here's the three areas of interest. And in 2018, we started studying the cistern. And just like with the drains in the southern area of Metales, it's clear that this cistern has been used for centuries, if not thousands of years. Um, so continuing to investigate this area. Um, new avenues of research um, this past season, again, based um, based upon the limits of a transitional season, one thing that we felt we could do is to start exploring uh, where the stones, the Cyclopean masonry um, came from on the Citadel. Uh, these are very large stones, uh, many tons in weight. So surely they came uh, uh, as local as possible to facilitate um, access and transport. And just to the west of the site in the saddle of um, a little low point that connects uh, the citadel to the larger ridge that extends to the De Desfina town. Uh, we, in fact, uh, started seeing areas uh, potentially with saw marks and also uh, quarried stones. Uh, oops. So you can see here uh, on the right, we started investigating areas where there seems to be blocks that were in the middle of, of being constructed. Um, the other area of, of research we wanted to develop, um, possible because we weren't excavating so many trenches this season, was we wanted to make sure we um, develop a major part of our research, which is in line with what the Peabody Museum does. And that's, of course, natural history. And because of the organic residue studies I do, I also have to figure out how um, they are uh, concocting uh, the different medicines and perfumes that they're making. And uh, one of the samples we took, for instance, is a very, um, famous local plant. Uh, called Black Hellebore. And this is a sample that was collected this season that then will provide a chemical reference for the um, the different ingredients I find in the pottery from the Bronze Age. Um, and the reason why uh, we're not, I mean, the way this works is every um, bit of uh, data informs the other. Uh, we know that Black Hellebore is famous. It was specifically cited in the, the ancient text as being special in this area. It was used, uh, for instance, um, by an ancestor of Hippocrates, we think, uh, according to the, the, the history accounts, to help um, uh, overcome um, and siege a nearby town, the port city of, of Delphi. And the story goes that this ancestor of Hippocrates uh, used this plant to uh, to uh, poison the, the the water supply of this uh, of this city um, to the point where all the defenders got sick uh, because we know that this plant in huge doses causes things like dysentery and all kinds of other problems. So um, of course, what's fascinating about that is um, we know that the, the in fact this plant in the modern day the the ingredients do. Uh, 
produce those kinds of symptoms. Um, and it's connected to the historical account because one thing that people suspect is that perhaps um, this uh, physician's descendant, Hi Hippocrates, uh, in fact, made the Hippocratic oath, you know, um, to, uh, that doctors take today of doing no harm. Uh, some people um, uh, uh, speculate that it was done in part by the descendant because his ancestor himself did great harm. Uh, to to other people based upon with this plant, so um, we are coming up with a da ethnobotanical database because then that will allow us to recognize the different uh, chemical compounds that uh, we find in the different pottery. So that's an important part uh, that most projects don't do, of course, but it's uh, uniquely supported um, by the Peabody Museum and fits very much along with our more holistic study of. Uh, the environment um, and, and everything else, medicine, and not just looking at pottery. Um, I want to end with by start talking about our next uh, seasons. Uh, so at, one of the last things we did this past summer was um, to uh, study uh, the port site, potential port site I mentioned earlier. So we visited that uh, for the first time this season and looked around and looked at the promise of it. And yes, we could open up more trenches on, at the Citadel. Um, uh, but on the other hand, we still got to study all the legacy artifacts in the last uh, almost 20 years. Um, so we, I myself am hesitant to just open up more trenches uh, without understanding a bigger picture um, of this region and also all the lingering questions that we don't quite understand. So um, what we're leaning towards doing is uh, to gain a better understanding of this area is to, is to in fact go to Steno uh, and do uh, an official survey there. And you can see the the the, the very excellent harbor uh, to this day, this dual harbor. And I'm, we're, I'm standing on the Acropolis here. Here's the dual harbor. This goes out to the Corinthian Gulf that allows you access then uh, to um, the west and and point south and north, like southern Italy. Uh, and on this uh, uh, citadel. Um, harbor site, what our ceramicists noticed along with the rest of us is that the material culture there, uh, it's much smaller than Castrulli, but it's as um, the, the pottery is as fine, if not more fine than at Castrulli and, and almost certainly imported wares from all over. So of course, um, that answers uh, bigger questions for us at the moment. So um, our preference now is to study this area and it'll give us a more wider view of what this region is all about before we continue with any further excavations at Castrulli itself. So our plan this summer is to um, uh, survey this area, pick up pottery, walk transects, and do all the drone photographies, photogrammetry, and then understand better this side before we proceed with doing any other ma major excavations up on the main citadel. So uh, starting this summer, since now I'm at the Pita Body Museum, one thing this allows us to do, for instance, um, we're planning in March to do a training of sorts um, with the resources allowed because it's much more convenient, of course, to train here than it is to train overseas uh, with a significant cost. So our plan in March is to go to an island that's owned uh, by the museum off the coast. And um, because of its uh, relatively isolated nature, it allows us to do uh, to test and train all kinds of um, techniques uh, from multispectral drone um, photography to ethnobotanical sampling, everything else. So it's a perfect um, a place for a week or so uh, to train our team. And then that will allow us uh, with DGPS and everything else. And that will allow us to proceed um, uh, very efficiently in the summer at this new site, harbor site, uh, to, to conduct the same uh, types of studies. Uh, so to wrap up the future work, yes, we will continue to study the previous remains at Castrulli that was excavated in these previous seasons. Um, at the same time, we'll selectively target new excavation areas to answer ongoing research questions. And I, I highlight this point because again, our, our, as easy as it is would be to, to open up five more areas on uh, the site and discover all kinds of interesting things, um, that type of approach has been done before at much more famous sites. So yes, we'd be guaranteed to find uh, very interesting pottery, perhaps even more linear B, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but will that truly um, uh, revolutionize our understanding of the area and of Mycenaean culture? We don't believe so. Um, at least we don't uh, feel compelled enough to open up five more trenches. Because again, that 
um, prevents us from uh, devoting resources to other areas like geology and, and botany and and so on and so forth. So uh, we will still target new areas um, at, at a future date, but we'll do so very carefully and methodically. Uh, in the Despina plane itself, We'll continue to un better understand its relationship with its own worked uh, areas, the hydrological engineering, the potter's quarters. Uh, and this will be diachronic. So yes, we will study, again, the Mycenaean period. But it's clear based upon the other remains, even though in later time periods, there wasn't a major citadel like in the Mycenaean period, it's clear that there were still many uh, people um, taking advantage of this plain, even though there wasn't a major urban center from what we can tell until the Hellenistic period. Uh, but we'll continue to study this diachronic uh, relationship between uh, these societies and the environment of the Desfina plain. We'll continue to core uh, the area to the south and study the Potter's Quarter to get a better idea of, of again, how um, these societies operated. And something that's never been done is we want to document uh, diachronically all the extent architecture. I pointed out at the beginning, um, these major built structures from all uh, time periods um, and not just from antiquity, but uh, even after the Byzantine period and onwards, there's, there's major uh, um, ruins and structural remains. We'll start by doing the high resolution drone images and then we'll actually go on the ground and then start documenting those things as best as possible, whether through photogrammetry, architectural drawings, et cetera. So that that's the, the, the lingering goal. Um, as more of my students uh, graduate and form their own research nodes, they could partake in, depending on which time they're interested in, you know, really just anything from prehistoric all the way to early, the early modern period. There's something for everybody to study. And of course, the harbor. So starting in the summer, we will kind of, uh, at least for a time, shift our attention there because we feel that the harbor can reveal um, a lot of answers that we're not familiar with right now. So that's the hope. And then of course, the original questions that, um, that brought us to the area is um, the role and place of Southern focus um, uh, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean um, by comparing the technology, the crafts and the different things made and consumed in Southern focus, uh, we, already understood the similarities in the material culture with places that are pretty far away in the late Bronze Age, like Eastern Crete and Southern Italy and the Southern Levant. So um, an area that's not famous, but it's clear that it's connected to much farther areas. So um, without it being mentioned uh, overtly in, in, in mythological and historical accounts, we can clearly see archeologically speaking that it, it has uh, answers to provide and these um, larger questions. And arguably this is how these uh, answers will, will, will come about, not from just keep on studying Mycenae and Athens and places like that, Megiddo, but also to study these regions that clearly were a part of this larger late Bronze Age Koine, but to this point has has uh, not had resources devoted to their study. So that's uh, the goal in uh, the next uh, coming years. Um, I hope that was informative and um, I'm happy to answer any kind of questions uh, people might have. So thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. I am really impressed, even though I was there in 2018, so I saw part of the things I participated in some of the things we did, but like seeing it put together like this, like the holistic approach, not just excavating the site, but looking around it and doing all kinds of interdisciplinary work. This is amazing. And I, it's like a textbook example of how a site like this should be researched. So really awesome lecture. Um, Thank and you. Now, I want to open like uh, the questioning session. So everyone who has a question, please leave it in the chat. We already have one. It's from Carol Schneier. And the question is, which plants, animals, were the recovered fabrics made from? Uh, okay, I stopped the share. I'm, uh, before we uh, answer the question, uh, is everything still showing okay, Luva? Well, the presentation is not showing. So uh, if you want to go back to something, you have to share your screen again. But, uh, if ah. you can, but you don't have to, unless you want okay. to like, um, point to an example or something. 
Okay, okay. So I, I, I think we could figure that out. So okay, let's let me, uh, because yeah, for me to uh, open the chat window, uh, when I did that, it it, it stopped the share, I think, uh, or something. Oh, okay. Maybe. Anyway, uh, we could we could start that again in a second. Uh, Is Carol asking uh, the organic residues, Luba? Uh, no, she's asking um, the so because we found like the inscription in the linear B, so ah. about textiles and stuff. So like, uh, what kind of like animal or plant would have was it made from? Like, um, sure. Uh, yeah, presumably um, because of uh, not ju not just ethnographic parallels, but we know from other areas like Crete. Um, uh, and also we know from Egyptian accounts, it's clear that one of the things that the Egyptians in the new kingdom imported. So people like, uh, uh Amenhotep the third in the, in the so-called Amarna period, right? If you go to Malkada, uh, which is his, one of his palaces there in the Western bank of, of Thebes, um, in this golden age of ancient Egypt, they had, um, Minoan textiles, Greek textiles uh, painted on their ceilings, right, with bulls and running spirals. Um, of course, uh, Minoan textiles um, don't survive. Um, maybe small remnants of it do, um, but we know it from these facsimile paintings of textiles and descriptions and linear B accounts of the resources used. It, it, it's wool textiles. Uh, which is not surprising, uh, based upon uh, what the area provides. Uh, of course, um, a corollary to that is they weren't just wool textiles, but they were dyed, right? So that's mm -hmm. one of the areas where I've studied. Um, based upon the imagery from al in Egypt, and also um, a dye installation I studied in uh, it, it's Middle Bronze Age and on Crete, but again, same kind of ecosystem. Uh, the dyes I found there were um, uh, murex pur purple dye, so presumably a very elite context. But what's more fascinating about, uh, in addition to purple dye, uh, which could be purple or blue, of course, like uh, Tehelet, um, and, uh, I also found uh, evidence for yellow and red. Uh, so yellow matter uh, from the matter plant and, um, uh, oh no, red matter. So the red came from the ma matter plant and yellow came from woad. So these are plants. And of course the purple is from a sea mollusk. Um, this is middle bronze and presumably by the iron age, um, they're getting uh, increasingly uh, purple and blues coming from indigo, the indigo plant from South Asia. Uh, so uh, that's another study I did at, at a place in central um, Anatolia, Gordian, the huge Iron Age uh, textile drapes that were burnt there. We thought they looked purple and we thought they were going to be murex, uh, which would have been fantastically wealthy, but it was King Midas. But in fact, it's from plant. It's from, it's from indigo and not from uh, the very expensive uh, purple, royal purple dye. So um, presumably at, at the late Bronze Age time period here, uh, was there murex uh, potentially? But even based upon the evidence from Egypt, almost certainly the purple was, um, because it's so laborious and expensive to make, you know, you got to use 10,000 of these little snails to to make a little scarf or something in purple. So um, uh, it seems that purple was more like an accent. Uh, so when you look at the the, the Aegean textiles and uh, they're painted in, in Egyptian context, most of the color is is, is yellow and uh, red and these other colors, and then um, and then the purple is, is is more limited. So people always assume it's like the Roman period and they were wearing like these lavish ro um, robes, so on and so forth. Uh, but that's that's a much later phenomenon. And in this Bronze Age, it just seems that um, they did use purple, obviously, but it was much more limited. Um, uh, the famous example being of course, when um, Alexander the Great uh, won his first battles against the Persian Empire, one of the first things he did when he went to the Sardis treasury was to uh, recapture this famous huge bolt of purple dyed fabric uh, and return it to the Greek city state that it was taken from by the Persian king. So it wasn't, we, we don't think until that kind of classical period that they were really, we're really talking about um, that type of uh, uh, number of, I mean, it must take a millions of, of these sea snails to make a bolt 
amount of, of purple and they didn't even use it. It was more like, um, it's like Fort Knox, like a gold repository. It's just like their wealth was all in this huge bolt of purple uh, and they didn't use, it. I guess, I guess if they needed money, they could, they could, they could sell a part of it or something like that. But it was almost like uh, a commodity, right? Like that you keep to, uh, to base your, your, your economy on. So um, we're just at the early stages of discovering um, what they, uh, we're weaving. We know they're so we have the traditional bits of evidence, as, as you saw in 2018. We have the loom weights. Um, we have the linear B sign, which is somewhat unusual, but we knew about that already. And what this project can do because of the resources we're dedicating and the fact that this site is, is specializing apparently in, in, in textiles is we can start. Um, one asking the questions because we're investing the resources in it, but then we're com we're confident that the the evidence that will come up will help us answer these questions, right? So you, uh, one you got to look, which means you got to devote resources to answering these questions, which is not a given. And then the second half of it is you got to have uh, assessed properly that those questions can be answered, and that because of the uh, of the circumstances, we're confident that we can answer a lot of questions pertaining to te te uh, textile, since it seems to be a focus of this area. So you can see the components that are necessary to answer these questions. Is you got to hope that the the material remains will answer those questions until you actually got to study them properly. So um, textiles are definitely, um, because we've studied in the past, and this area is a, a major production center apparently for it, uh, it's something that we um, will we'll, we'll uncover in the coming years. Well, looks like you have all the perfect conditions to do, to find everything there is to find. So looking forward to seeing that. Um, I have a question. So you mentioned about the diet that they were eating a lot of seafood and stuff. What kind of like um, osteological analysis have you been uh, doing, conducting on the materials, the skeletal remains? Sure. So um, uh, this started in, uh, like I said, 2005 with the rescue excavations. So even though that's not that long ago, we're very much approaching um, this as a legacy excavation. Obviously, it's 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 easier than studying uh, 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 collection objects from 100 years ago. Uh, I'm also doing that as well at Yale. There's a lot of projects that were, you know, like Dura Europus was excavated 100 years ago, and I'm looking at some of that material at Yale. Uh, nobody's around from that time period, obviously, so that's a little trickier uh, because the documentation, you know, as many as, as no matter how good notebooks are, we, we know that there's always questions that remain unanswered. So thankfully with the 2005 and subsequent excavations, people are still around so we can ask them questions. But nevertheless, it's very haphazard. We have the rescue stuff done by the Greek authorities in 2005 and the years after. We have the 2006 skiing uh, excavations from the first expedition. So what we have, what our attempt is to kind of one, uh, catalog everything, which is, again, not the most exciting work, but somebody has to do it and we're committed to it. So we're cataloging everything. We just did that this past season for the first time. Um, and then the idea is that, um, so going to your question, some of these mollusk remains were found in 2005. Some of them were found in 2016. So what we have to do is uh, uh, systematize it and then also put evidence that's collected by different people, even though it's the same tomb or whatever mm -hmm. on the same level so you can see that it's that, that that's probably gonna be something like a a, um, a desfina castrulli volume one final publication that we're working towards um which is also in part why um uh going back to my original point of not opening up more trenches and the reason for that is even though there isn't an extraordinary amount of of material that's been excavated over the last 20 years, it's very complicated because there were rescue excavations done by different parties, different people, diff in different languages, you know, English, Greek, and, you know, er and everything else. So um, to make sure this first volume can be published, I'm um, um, adamant that there's enough and it's enough of a challenge. So let's limit how much more we excavate in the Citadel, get this first publication out, and then that will set it up for whether it's us or one of my future students or whoever else, then they can start fresh with new excavations and do these proper volumes systematically, right? Rather than just, you know, we, we, we know so much doesn't get published. Um, that there's is always the, Yeah, there's the excitement of discovery, right? And that's good for the excavators. But then um, I'm, I'm a, uh, I, I guess I'm a very typical uh, 
in between Gen X or again, and I'm always worried of looking at all these museum collections where so much has never been published. You know, I can understand the excitement of finding something new, but I, I want to make sure things are studied properly and, and, and published properly. So um, the initial remains are, there were like fish bones, there were mollusk shells. Um, and then the faunal analysts, they pointed out um, that a lot of them had almost certainly, if not absolutely had to have been for uh, dietary consumption. Mm. Um, you know, there's always questions, right? When you find um, uh, murex shells, almost always it was for the purple dye extractions, but there's still cultures even today, like in Portugal or wherever, they, they, they still eat uh, hexaplast trunculus or, you know, murex or uh, those kind of sea snails. So it could be also for just eating the, the snails, right? So, um, but when you have fish bones up there and we're not right on the water, Presumably they don't have an aquarium. Presumably they're 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 eating uh, mm. the fish. So so the um, the normal things that just like today when you go to a seaside taverna, fish uh, and and other things uh, in their dietary uh, um, concern. So uh, a lot of this, as you know, has has not been really cataloged or studied. So uh, we we just got a ceramicist for the first time, and that's necessary. And then we're slowly going to um, incorporate full time specialists like uh, zoo archaeologists uh botanists etc so we're starting to build this team and that's what also going to um doing a field survey allows us to do we have a ceramicist we have drone experts so you can see why i want to really do a survey because this this harbor site fascinates me and we have the resources and expertise to do that the minute you start excavating a site so like again excavating more in the center of the citadel we might need a metallurgist we might need you know we need, you need all kinds of other specialists to do a proper study and there's again the concern that we haven't you know from the previous two expeditions not, there's been no final publication right so um rather than just you know digging more as you know there like i said we'll find really neat things but uh, again my fear is that will that be published and one will it be published in our lifetimes which is a legitimate <laughs> question and then number two devoting those resources necessary to excavate and publish it will preclude us from answering these bigger questions i think should fundamentally be answered first yeah i totally agree meanwhile we have two more questions one from Blair Barnes, who is interested in the Hellbore plant. Mm -hmm. He wants to know the clinical lab process for tracking down the plant sources of medicines and linking these to the past. So how actually your specialty, how does the process look? Sure, sure. Well, that's a great question. And this started from 20 years ago, because as you know, I originally started, uh, you know, I, I, I wore different hats and they were kind of compartmentalized. So when I'm running a trench, you know, I'm wearing the archaeologist hat, you know, doing mm -hmm. the typical thing with a notebook. And then uh, I always considered the archaeochemistry part like a separate thing like I go back home and I look I, I look through the museum and I look you know that's traditionally how it's been done you look at the most fascinating pieces that are most beautiful or most unique or elite and then I was kind of considered it separately but then as I was excavating um at, at, at this site in Crete I, I there was a very interesting context that came up and I thought well why can't we do field uh studies of the organics uh and not just look at a museum piece and and uh, and and do it all at once. And thankfully, I was an energetic uh, young graduate student because it is you know to really incorporate and inaugurate like kind of a new approach is very difficult uh, because it's also relying on, on on the generosity of of existing people, right? Catalogers and conservators saying, "Oh, can you not wash that yet?" <laughs> you know, things like that. You're interrupting the traditional process, which is a, a big ask. So. Um, uh, I developed all these kind of things. And the reason why I started to look at a bigger picture is um, the good thing about getting training in like archaeology, chemistry, and other fields is that you have a better idea um, of the possibilities and the limitations of each technique. So the good thing about chemistry is, as I tell people, yes, on one hand, the chemistry doesn't lie, right? When you When you put it through an instrument, and it says you have some a chemical compound. It came from somewhere. I mean, but you got to figure out: is it ancient? Is it modern contamination? Let's assume it's ancient, right? But even then, it doesn't. The machine doesn't come out 
contrary to these like TV shows, especially a lot of the like the American, you know, uh, you know, forensics and and you know NCIS and all the CSI and these kind of things, it, you, you don't just take the sample, put it in, and then the instrument comes out. Oh, they were drinking coffee at noon on the on the boulevard or something like that. Like it doesn't happen like that, right? Basically, the 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 chromatogram comes out and it shows you these peaks and it shows you you have these chemical compounds and then you got to piece together where it came from. So um, what I think, uh, you know, the, the funny thing is I, I, I kind of get everyone to help me because then here uh, to, to hate me, because then I, what I could kind of show you with the limitation of chemistry is that no matter how good your chemistry is, there's still a level of interpretation, right? Because you got to then, especially it's very messy in things like forensics and archaeology, because you got to actually um, say, how did you get from, you have the 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 fragments of what remains after centuries and then you got to make the argument it came from wine it came from a wine that has all these additives in it you gotta you gotta be able to uh, extrapolate backwards and make their arguments and honestly um to do that uh chemistry is very limited right because Chemistry is often in the modern day very theoretical, and they're not used to dealing with uh, fragments, incomplete data, so on and so forth, right? So oftentimes chemists aren't, pure chemists aren't the best people to understand and help you. The best people to help you are people who use chemistry, but are in these imperfect um, settings like um, uh, environmental studies, food sciences. They're used to working with the messy nature of, of of real life organics as people eat them and it, they degrade and decompose and all these other kind of things right so there's a big difference there so um in addition to help so i always thought with my, my additional training how can i get that complete picture or more complete picture and one thing i could leverage that a pure chemist can't is i could look at ancient recipes so whether it's an Egyptian papyrus or something like the Vienna Dioscorides, uh, which is a Byzantine text uh, written in Constantinople, uh, which is kind of a repository of knowledge of medicine probably for centuries. I mean, I'm convinced that the origins of many of these medical recipes and, and, and treatments are, you can probably trace them all the way back to the earliest parts of human societies, you know, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, uh, as they evolve. But there, I mean, uh, it's hard to think like, like Dioscorides wrote Vienna, uh, his De Materia Medica, he's from the region of what we would call today southeastern Turkey, right? So mm -hmm. being in, in that area, like how can you not think that he wasn't influenced or didn't have access to preceding traditions from Mesopotamia, which are which is very close, uh, so on and so forth. So what I do to recognize um, what these chemical components could have come from is I then look at uh, the recipes that are written about uh, in, in pretty good detail in, in, in things like Egyptian papyri, medical papyri and these, these uh, later texts. But then I also look at the botany, which we know pretty well, right? Because in addition to knowing, uh, of course, modern day botany, uh, we in fact know, uh, thanks, paleobotany is very well developed, um, doing pollen cores and, and those kind of things. Uh, people like Zohari um, have done really good studies about um, the distribution, the ancient distribution of plants, so on and so forth. So with all these different clues, I can then figure out um, uh, what was prevalent in this area. So that's where hellebore comes from. We know it was a very prominent plant in the area. Like this area was famous for the plant. So the first thing I do is say, I got to get a fingerprint of that plant and put it into the database because then if it's, if it's famous in, let's say the classical period, there's a good chance it wasn't just famous in the classical period, but the, the centuries leading up to it, right? It's not like all of a sudden it's like the fifth century and saying, oh, we're classical. Now we're going to figure out how to use plants. That's not how it works. You know, they, they were studying these plants for, you know, oftentimes we're, we're very, uh, what we call chronological snobs. We think that people, as you go further back, people are less sophisticated, but I don't think that's the case. So, um, if I, you can't find it if you don't, if you're not ready to find it, right? So once I can figure out the famous plants in the area, I put that, I, I analyze it, I collect the sample like I did with the hellebore, put it into our database. And then all of a sudden, then when we look at the pottery and then I get the chemical fragments and the, and, and the compounds, I can start saying, oh my gosh, this has all the components of hellebore. And if I didn't previously do that at the botanical research, I wouldn't have been able to properly recognize or at least definitively say that this plant was in there. So what I what I've 
uh, learned to do is the best way to recognize what they were eating and drinking is to kind of guess in a way what they might have been eating and drinking. And you can't do that with chemistry alone. You got to know history. You got to know these, you know, um, the region, you know, you got to know that all of this prominent in this area, right? You got to know what to look for. So if, if, if you were a pure chemist and chemists have done this to me, they said, well, in, the, in your chemical compounds, you say that you have wine and things like tartaric acid, but why couldn't it be tomatoes? And, and then what you got to understand is that they're thinking as chemists, they're just looking at the compounds and saying tartaric acid is in tomatoes. Never mind that tartaric acid doesn't occur, it doesn't occur a large amount in tomatoes. So that even from a chemistry standpoint, it almost rules it out. But then they're, they're also missing the point where like think like botanically tomatoes are, 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 are from the Americas originally. And they come much later. Yeah, they come much later. Uh, so it's they're... not possible for them to be there at this yeah. time. Because they're chemists, they're not historians, they're not mm -hmm. botanists. So, um, and not just um, and not just historians, but they're not what do you want to call them, anthropologists or whatever. So you got to know um, botanically what's possible, but then you also got to know culturally what people were consuming or using and what's available in the area. And as and that's a, that's highlighting the example where you can't just rely on one discipline. Like if you're just purely looking at the material culture and not at the chemical evidence, you're just guessing at that point, right? So you really do need all these different pieces. Um, and the more pieces you have, it helps you then um, get an accurate picture. That's basically the goal of what I've been doing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. and. Like a follow up for this one. So, is this plant still present there? Like, can you find? Yeah, it yeah. So, so uh, that's a very good point. So, you got to think kind of fourth dimensionally in terms of time, because, for instance, uh, this hellebore, we have to climb a nearby mountain to get it, uh, and, and for a couple of reasons. One, it's not the high point of the sea. It, it was like more of the summer, so you got to, of course, go higher in elevation to see where it survives. So then you got to think, well, if it's winter or earlier in the spring, it's probably more pre prevalent. And then you, if you go back. Uh, 3,000 years ago, it was less dry. So then you got to kind of reconstruct uh, the, the paleo environment. So, um, but for instance, people might say, well, did they truly, sometimes people make an erroneous judgment. Oh, they say in the historical record, they use this plant. But then when we look a lot around, the plant isn't here. So either um, they're making it up or we're misunderstanding what they used. But then again, you're missing, we're missing the point. Those people are missing the point that if you look, uh, again, rewind time, you, then you can look at the environment back then. Oh, lo and behold, you look at uh, pollen cores and these, this tree or this plant actually did grow in huge numbers. So you really do got to think very fourth dimensionally uh, and, and, and in a very interdisciplinary fashion, I think, to, to understand it's these kinds of things. Oh, the puzzle pieces. So yep. you're looking at the big picture. Yep, that's okay. right. It's Thank fun. you for this super detailed answer. We have another question from Carol Schneier. She's saying, from your picture, the walls of units one, four, and five seem to be aligned north to south. Was this significant? Uh, it is significant because, um, as you saw, the citadel is almost a perfect circle. Mm -hmm. uh, so almost certainly that's where the site started because um, it's a very long uh, kind of... Um, um, ridge it's kind of um kind of a, like a spear tip shape and if you go all the way to the west just on the other side of the the broadest part of the spear tip is where the the town of desfina was settled and as you go east it kind of goes pointier and pointier and, and at the tip of the spear is where uh this mound is that became the citadel um and naturally it's very circular but at the same time, then, then they fortified it with the Cyclopedian masonry. So yes, appears, um, as she had mentioned, they appeared north to south. And I think that's in part because we're excavating in the Southern Terrace. So naturally all the walls almost certainly are pointing towards the center of a circle. So what that means probably is that if you go to more to the, and we know this because there is a Southwest building that was excavated and th those walls are more going at an angle uh, so southwest and northeast, because it's at the southwest part of the side and it's pointing toward the middle. So it, it's like a pie, right? So mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's basically they're building the structures uh, with the southern wall aligned with uh, the outer wall. And of course, that's circular. 
So uh, without doing, I mean, we know this from the geo prospection, um, but we can guess based upon many of these kind of circular sites. I mean, if you go further north towards Bulgaria, we of course know the famous sites of like Sesklo and Dimini, these, these prehistoric sites, and they're circular and, and, and they're, they're based upon the terrain. They're kind of built in that kind of circular area. They're, so in essence, um, when you have a circular site with the terrain that kind of slopes like a mound, of course, you're not going to just build uh as the romans did on a flat plane um you're you're not going to be using a grid system that's rectilinear mm. right it's going to be more organic and circular yeah so follow the natural terrain basically and like use it so makes sense oh i see your next question that's a great question is that i i i left out the slide because i didn't want to kill you guys with like ancient greek but uh <laughs> But what's interesting, one of the reasons why we uh, identify this, the citadel with a Homeric site is because when people describe this Homeric site, uh, they, they, one of the things that's constantly cited, uh, in fact, the name of the town uh, on Morea is it basically means like the windy place. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is very windy and the valley that kind of leads up uh, north from the site that then leads east to the Potter's Quarter. There, I pointed out uh, without mentioning it in detail. There's like a valley, uh, mm -hmm. and on top of it, the the authors, many uh, pilgrims to the area, mention that they go to Delphi. Oh, and I visited the Capopterion. So basically, what it is is uh, uh, they they say it's a really cool place where from the top of Mount Kirphis, this valley uh, channels the winds, uh, and it must have been a uh, noteworthy phenomenon enough that people visited it and what's fascinating is and i think this is also in part what what made kastruli such a uh a popular settlement site is the wind blows right on the site and of course that's important because you know even back then it got really hot right so um because of these wind patterns so on and so forth um i love that question because uh, again another bit of evidence that's virtually ignored when we talk about archaeology because it's kind of ephemeral right like how do you talk about wind uh you know it's mentioned in it, it was important enough in this area that's mentioned by many people but it, so it'd be very fascinating if somebody did a, a proper study i don't as far as i know nobody's ever done like wind archaeology or something like that so um but that's our goal is again to be very holistic so that's a fantastic question and um it's very windy and that's why they do have the windmills there but um it's something that should be studied like wind patterns and, and it fits along with climate that's why i also mentioned uh when i showed you the pictures of it raining and just stopping that very mm -hmm. much has to do with those strong winds because it's blowing these these fronts over and, it, it, and, it, and as the clouds blow over the the mountain there mount kirfus it, it, it then uh, forces the rain out of these clouds right because um you know that as the clouds get pushed up they can hold less water and then the, it, that's what causes rain right so these kind of patterns i don't think as far as i know um like meteorological phenomena i don't think anyone's really published so much on that that's a great topic actually <laughs> yeah, this is like a specific microclimate that is like just there specific to this one spot because of geography and everything else. And um, it can lead to interesting conclusions like was it the same back then? Did people pick it for a specific reason related to that? Or were they like trying to hide from the wind or harness the wind? So totally cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah, they absolutely have to do it. And, and uh, uh, you're right. We have to be careful about uh, assuming that it was 100% the same uh, between the uh, present and past. But I think most studies have shown, uh, even with climate change and things drying out and things like that, major phenomenon uh, like these wind uh, patterns, because uh, geographically, the mountains really haven't changed, right? Uh, mm. So the, the train really hasn't changed significantly in the in, in the Anthropocene period or whatever you want to call it. So uh, I think it's safe to assume uh, those kind of phenomenon. And then, of course, the historical accounts back it up, like these crazy winds and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, like that little wind tunnel, that, that valley has been there for who knows how long, a million years. So... Um, uh, fundamentally, those things uh, don't change. I, I love that question uh, about the wind power and windmills. I don't think anybody has ever, in, fa in fact, I, when I talked to the mayor recently, 
he was uh, in, in a in a tran tangential question. He said, "Hey, aren't you like Korean American?" I said, "Yes." And he goes, "You know, the the, the Koreans build a lot of the infrastructure here. Do you have any kind of connection to <laughs> the people who build windmills <laughs> and and stuff like that?" And I don't uh, directly, but uh, it's 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 fascinating. That's another example where in the modern day they 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 are concerned about the wind and power. So that's a great question. It's like, how did from what we know now, how did this affect the day-to-day -day life and worldview of these ancient people and climate, wind, water, you know, especially we talked about it in very gross terms because you need water to survive, but even mm. more subtle things. I know there's been some studies like at the, the so-called Minoan Palace at Knossos, they talk about, oh, the apartments were on the lower level because then it had access to the cool, uh, you know, winds coming from the river. You know, people talk about it in very loose terms, but from, from my sense is that it's not very scientific. <laughs> Like they haven't done, I mean, these aren't like, uh, you know, microclimate experts or anything like that. So it'll be fascinating. Uh, might be another uh, more modern, um, uh, especially like the like institution I'm involved with now, they're interested in and very much interested in environment and, and paleoecology and stuff. So that might be a whole other area. Um, I, very much, I think it's it's very much the future, as we know, that we can't just be based out of you know, X departments, but, you know, we've traditionally worked with other departments. So um, they have the expertise and um, they have the the mission to ask these questions dealing with climate increasingly. So why not collaborate with them? That's a great question. Of course. Um, so next question from Carol Schneier. Uh, wasn't Aeolus the ancient god of winds? Wow, such good questions, because one of the reasons... Um, a good friend of mine from graduate school, who's a, a professor of ancient history uh, at Florida State, one of the reasons why he joined um, our team this past summer is because we noted that there's these main, these um, not super well known necessarily, but certainly significant back then uh, stories and mythologies uh, attached to this area. Right. So, for instance, I'll give you an example of that is from this very mountain, uh, there was kind of one of these fantastic monsters and beasts called Sybaris. Mm -hmm. And he or she or whatever you want to call it, depending on the mythology, uh, they would come uh, this this beast would come down and depends on the story, and the time period, they could, it could be something as simple as, uh, you know, uh, it's, it reminds me of like modern myths, like as when you're a kid, if you don't behave, the monster's going to get you or something like that, right? So it's the same yeah. kind of story where this monster comes down and again, it ties to textiles because in, in the pastoral culture here is the Sybaris beast would come down and consume a lot of the um, uh, the sheep and things like that. Uh, and then the funny, the interesting thing is that then it gets tied into like local pride and things like that because there's also other myths like when uh the neighboring rivals caught they came and tried to raid the sheep and the beast came down and attacked them all well it could be something as simple as they're spreading that uh myth so then nobody comes and takes their sheep <laughs> you know so there's all it's, it's it's very it's very much folklore mythology and it's very fascinating but what's what's even more fascinating is the larger ramifications because if the name if the, the name of this beast Sybaris sounds familiar there's a major uh colony started uh in southern italy today called sybaris it was a major site uh on the bottom of the boot of italy a greek colony uh and what's fascinating is uh one of the the city states on the other side of the corinthian gulf what they sent out ships or whatever an expedition to start this satellite city state in, in now it's southern italy and they named it Sybaris. And then the, the explanation given kind of on the side is that one of them was familiar with this myth that takes place in our very backyard. Uh, and they named their own site after it. So um, it's really fascinating that there's all these connections. And what's even more fascinating is we talked to um, a good friend of our uh, Greek collaborator who's he's known him since he's a kid. He's a shepherd who actually um, works in that area where Sybaris comes from. And he said, oh, there's a, there's the cave. I wonder if, there, if it's, if we explained to him the myth from the classical time periods and later, and he said, oh, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a cave right around on the other side that facing Delphi. And I have to go rescue sheep from in there sometimes, you know, I wonder how they got in there, someone and so forth. And he goes, oh, you know, by the way, I found like archaeological ceramics in there too. I should probably have told you about that. So what's fascinating is that this could very well be the cave that this myth talks about. 
And it's, it's funny, it's interesting that in the modern day, it still has kind of that, that role. They, tear, they tell their kids, don't go in there, it's scary, the monster, something will happen to you. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, 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 again, this whole angle that's not that's been I, I know when I was in graduate school there was a whole folklore mythology program which I don't think exists anymore um, but it's absolutely fascinating because um, the other so what my friend Trevor is researching is that the same another uh, shepherd in the area said oh we, we said tell us funny or interesting stories and he said oh you know at the top of Mount Kirfus, um, uh I never believed it but my grandmother told me that there are like fairies and creatures up there and then one day I was looking there in my little shepherd's hut and I, I, I saw lights up on the hilltop. And I said, why are, there must be intruders or something like that. I better go check it out. So he went up there and he swears he saw like, like glowing little fairies. So like, <laughs> what, the, what, the, what the heck is that, right? And then, okay, you might, that might be just like, maybe he had too much to drink or whatever else like that, right? But, but it's fascinating because then you look at the ancient records and in fact, they uh, my 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 friend and collaborator found references to something similar happening. So again, my, my scientific mindset is that it's something uh, with the sun. You know, it's something you know natural, right? That mm. then people explain through myth. It's whatever that might be, I don't know, but it's fascinating that um, you have references to it in the present day. And then it's really, uh, isn't it kind of fascinating when you, you see references from a 500 years, like repeated references to the same phenomenon from 500 years ago, a thousand years ago, or 2000 years ago. And so, so my friend, uh, Trevor, he's an ancient historian. So he, it's roughly within his field of expertise. So he's starting to try to uncover these kind of mythologies and stories. So that's an absolute great question because then it involves people like Aeolus and, and, and because there's also, uh, re- going back to Carol's question, if I remember correctly, and this is again Trevor's expertise, uh, I, I believe Sybaris is also responsible for things like uh, strange sounds and winds and all, you know, like it, like this creature's up to mischief, right? Like so it's a kind poltergeist of poltergeist in- from back then. That, that's exactly what they this person called it. It's like a poltergeist, right? Mm-hmm. So it's something of that sort. So whether it's used to explain natural phenomenon, I just find it absolutely fascinating that you have modern day shepherds who are part of the same tradition that probably yeah, took place over story. thousands of years. They're telling the same stories. From like... and, and it's, it's, it's absolutely interesting. And it's not like they were, I mean, in some cases, maybe, but it's not like they're just passing it down you know, parent to child for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. It, it's clear that uh, in some cases it might've happened for short periods, but I think it's clear that these are like um, uh, new instances of the same thought based upon whatever is happening in their environment, right? It's just mm-hmm. hu- humans, we're humans. Uh, so depending, and we're responding uh, centuries later. To the, the same, same probably from, yeah it's absolutely it's a, and then but then some of it i think is are might be faint echoes like when you talk about mythological creatures so on and so forth those in fact might be like uh myths and stories that are, that are uh at least in a i get more skeptical when it's very specific but when it's general it might be something that's loosely that evolves and, and does get passed down over many 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 generations it's really fat again another area totally unstudied right yeah, another more puzzle piece. Another puzzle piece, yeah. Okay, so any more questions, anyone? Because I don't, yeah, I think this is the last one I have. Um, if so, we can wrap this up. Mm, I don't see anyone else chiming in. So thank you everyone who joined us for tonight's seminar. Thank you. Hope you found it interesting, gave you some food for thought. And um, like Dr. Ko said, you can always contact him for questions and stuff. Um, and um, we'll see you next year with our next BAMO seminar, which will be the second uh, Saturday of January. Um, the topic will be a mystery for now. So follow us on social media and we will uh, announce it once the new year starts. So have a good evening or a great day, depending on which side on the globe you are. And um, hope to see you soon.